Good morning again. If you have your Bibles and want to open them up to the Gospel of John, that's where we're going to be today. We're going to be jumping around quite a bit, but uh, you can open there where we are going to start. I want to start this morning with a, a statement. Uh, the statement is simply this, there's a lot of darkness in our world. A lot of darkness. I wanted to do an unscientific poll um, with some unscientific people. Uh, that's y'all. How many of you feel like, show of hands, how many of you feel like the darkness, the evil, the overall sinfulness of the world is increasing? Oh, we had hands up before I even finished. (laughs) That's what I thought. Pretty much everybody, right? We're all on the same page with that. Um, The world is a very dark, dark place. Two weeks ago, I was on a, a conference call, a Zoom video call with some of our brothers who are planting churches in our underground church network. And um, they shared a video with me, all of us on the call, that uh, showed one of our pastors who had been arrested, not, not arrested, captured by a mob, it wasn't the law. He was under this little hut. He was being interrogated. Went on for about six hours. They had much of it on video. Some people had videoed it. And uh, through the course of the time, uh, he was beaten, had his fingers broken, his face began to swell and got bloody from being slapped and hit. They took blades, different kinds, and cut his chest and his arms, his back, all in an attempt to get him to recant his faith. He never would. Never did. The end of it, they didn't kill him, thankfully. Uh, he was in really bad shape, but he was stripped naked. He was drugged outside of his town and told never to return. The world is a dark, dark place. And even when you try to be the light, you can find yourself in dark situations, as he did. Earlier this week, I shared on my Twitter feed a video of a young Muslim girl. I say young. She was probably 19, 20, maybe 22. I I don't know. Somewhere in that, that range. She was being drugged by her hair when the video starts through a street. And there are some guys chasing her. One guy's dragging her. Other guys are chasing her. And there she's, she's on her back, kind of on her hind end and being drugged. And they're kicking her and stomping her and hitting her with sticks, not, not big sticks, what you might call a, a sapling, more like a whip. And she's screaming and crying, trying to get help, and everybody's watching. Nobody's doing anything. And ultimately, this, this mob of men surround her near the bar ditch, and a little uh, motorized three-wheeler thing pulls up, and a... a, a thing comes up on the video that says, this is her father, and you think dad's coming to the rescue, man. He he jumps off the bike, and and your heart begins to kind of well up, and you think, hey, he's going to come and save his little girl, and he grabs a club, Not, not a stick, a club, and he begins to hit her, and then he begins to hit her in the head, and she falls to the ground, and The camera pans away, and her screaming stops, and you know what's happened. She's dying or dead at that moment. Her great crime to humanity was that her father had decided to marry her off to an older man in his late 50s or early 60s. I don't remember the exact age. Much older than her, though. And she didn't want to marry him. She had fallen in love with a guy her own age, and they ran off together, Romeo and Juliet. Her brothers and uncles tracked her down in a nearby town, and when they found her, they called the rest of the family, and all the men in her family came and killed her. It's what they call a honor killing. Happens thousands and thousands and thousands of times every year in our world. 
Nobody was arrested, nobody was tried, even though honor killings are banned in this particular country. Nobody cared. I showed the video to my wife, Abby. I'm not going to show it here today. It's far too graphic. And um, my wife, Abby, she, she said, can you imagine living in a place where you can't even feel safe with your own family and in your own home? It, it was one of the darkest most disturbing things I have ever seen in my life. And it was an unpleasant reminder of the darkness, the depravity, and the deep, deep state of desperation our world is in because of sin. And the reality is, is we don't have to look very far to see the darkness. We don't have to go to other countries. We don't have to go to other places. We don't have to use extreme examples like those to see it. It's right here surrounding us. No doubt, it's even here this morning among us. And even though the the darkness is startling and it's shocking and, and it's scary, I want to remind you today that it's also easy to see the light. There's a lot of light in our world as well. We've seen many examples of that this week. We've seen goodness and righteousness and holiness. I'm sure you've seen it. In fact, I I bet you've even been used by the Lord at some point recently to be the light in somebody's life. And and you might be saying, well, yeah, but but it was a really small thing. It was a small light. Or it might have even seemed very insignificant to you, whatever kind of light God called you to be. But you know, you never know how God's going to use a small, insignificant beam of light to change somebody's life, or day, or world. The truth is this, church, the light never fears the darkness. It's the darkness that is afraid of the light. You see, darkness knows it cannot defeat the light. Darkness knows it cannot overcome the light. Darkness knows and understands that the light is always going to win. It doesn't mean the darkness is going to stop trying. It doesn't mean the darkness is going to pause its effort and its operation. But it should bring us hope and encouragement to know that the light is going to win. I want you to hear these words of Jesus, just one verse, because I don't want you to get lost in anything else today. Just this one verse in John chapter 8, verse 12. Jesus says these words. He says, I am the light of the world. And anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The message right there is is simple, super simple. Jesus is the light, and then anyone who follows Jesus, the light, will not walk in darkness and will have the light of life. (laughs) Pretty simple. There's something interesting here about this text that many of you probably don't know. There's a context to it that many of us would never know if we don't visit the Holy Land or if we don't intricately study Jerusalem and the Holy Land and the temple. Jesus, he, he said these words in the temple complex. He, he said them actually in what is known as, or was known as, the court of women. This was the area in the temple that was the furthest women could go into the temple. That's why they called it the court of women. Women couldn't go any further than this particular Court And it's here that Jesus is standing, and several things happen here, but he says these words here in this court. And the interesting thing about this court is this court had four very large um, candle arbras, if you will, that look like menorahs, if you know what a menorah is. And, and when I say large, these things were massive. They were 75 feet tall to the top, seven and a half stories to the top. And, and these, these huge candles, these huge 
oil lit lanterns, if you will. They were lit during the Feast of Tabernacles. And they served as this massive, overwhelming source of light. They would be lit every night during the Feast of Tabernacles, and they would burn all night long, and people would come, and there would be music, and dancing, and singing, and even the rabbis, even the the chief priests, everybody would come, and they would dance around the bottom here in this court of the bottom of these, these lights, and they would dance all night long and have these huge celebrations and parties and festivals. And and the lights were designed, they would send a beam up into the night sky of light. And it was designed to remind God's people of how God had led them with a pillar of fire by night out of the wilderness. Had great visual impact. It would be what we might call a searchlight, just, just going up into the sky. And so big and so brilliant was this light, one ancient Jewish source declared this, there was not a courtyard in all of Jerusalem that did not receive the blessing of their light. Speaking of these candelabras. Another described the massive amount of light by saying the light filled the entire city of Jerusalem. Another source described it like this, the festival and ritual lighting was a reminder that God had promised to send a light the light to a sin-darkened world. God promised to send the Messiah to renew Israel's glory, to release them from bondage, and to restore their joy. And there, under these lights, with that as the backdrop, this is the context in which Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The light of the world had come and was there with them, and yet they couldn't see him. In fact, they would soon murder him. It seems clear to me that Jesus wanted everybody to know and understand this one thing, our big idea, this one thing, there is no life without the light. He wanted everybody to know there is no life without the light. Darkness leads to death. Light leads to life. And the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ produces this huge, massive, overwhelming collision between darkness and light. And can I just tell you the light one? I want to share with you today five areas that we see light win through the life of Jesus, and we're not going to spend long on any of them. They're all important. I had 20, but I narrowed it down to five. Um, Again, as we did a couple of weeks ago, I'm going to share some more this week in the Daily Devo. They're going to put the QR code up. If you don't have the Daily Devo or get the Daily Devo, you can get your phones out and um, you can scan the QR code and get it. If you're online, it should work for you as well. If you're a radio listener, you'll just have to go to the website, pastorpete.org, and sign up there to get them. But we're going to share some of the others this week. But today I want to give you five. The first one is this. To the darkness of doubt, Jesus is the light of faith. Doubt is one of the deepest and most terrifying kinds of darkness there is. There are many things you can doubt in life. Spiritually, you can doubt your salvation. Many people go through those seasons in life where they wonder if they're saved. They wonder if it it really took. (laughs) They, they, They wonder if God has really forgiven them. They begin to doubt that. You can doubt God's love. You can doubt God's faithfulness. You can doubt the faithfulness of your spouse and get into a dark place in your life where you think, Every time they pick up their phone, they must be texting someone else. You you can doubt your ability as a parent. I think all parents go through that at some point where they feel like they're not good enough or, or they've made wrong decisions or they've done things that are wrong for their kids and you've messed them up forever. You can doubt your ability as an employee. You can you can doubt your ability as a friend. You can get into a place where you doubt your government. And everything you see and everything you hear and everything you watch leads you to be skeptical and and doubt 
the government that leads you. You can, you can doubt the sincerity of your pastor, your elders, your lay pastors, your deacons. You can doubt the sincerity of those who lead whatever church you go to. You can doubt your future or things about your future. You can doubt your self-worth or your value to yourself and to others. You can doubt every decision you ever make. Did I make the right one? Was that right? Was that wrong? How did they take that? What, why, why did I say that? Why did I do that? There's truly no shortage of things in life you can doubt. But if you've ever been down the road of doubt, like I have, you've likely discovered the same thing I've discovered about this road. It is a dark and dangerous road. Walking through life with Jesus produces a strong faith in our life that overcomes our doubts. Sometimes I think about the road that, that Thomas was on when I'm going through seasons of doubt. You know, Thomas, following the crucifixion, he was struggling with believing because he wasn't there when Jesus appeared the first time to the disciples, so he lingered in doubt. And before you beat old Thomas up, that you probably would have too. I mean, this isn't unreasonable. I mean, imagine what he's being asked to believe. And even though all the others around him, people that he trusted, people that he knew, people that he had spent time with him, kept saying, hey, you, you need to believe this. We actually saw him. He's alive. Thomas just couldn't. I mean, he, he continued to linger in doubt and darkness. That is until the light came into his room. Jesus, the light of the world, he said this to Thomas. He said, put your finger here and look at my hands. Reach out with your hand and put it into my side. Don't be faithless, but believe. And Thomas responded to him, my Lord and my God. Look at verse 29 here in John 20. Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. My Lord and my God, the light of faith always wins over the darkness of doubt. There are many of us who need to hear that right now because there are so many doubts floating around in our hearts and our minds. I want to encourage you this week to do something with your doubt. I don't want to encourage you to just forget about your doubt. I don't want to encourage you to ignore your doubt. I don't, I don't want to encourage you to sweep your doubt under the rug or push it aside. Because here's what I know to be true. If you do that with doubt, it always comes back. Instead, I want to encourage you to do something different with your doubt. I want to encourage you to let the light touch it. I want to encourage you to let the light touch your doubt. Let the light of Christ Speak to that doubt. Let the light of Jesus come into that room and touch it. Let the light scare it away. You're going to waste away in the darkness of doubt if you don't let the light touch it. Jesus is the light. He is the light of faith. And there is no life without the light. Number two, to the darkness of vengeance, Jesus is the light of forgiveness. Vengeance and forgiveness. Collision right there. Okay, let's be honest. Will y'all be honest this morning? Y'all promise to be honest? Say amen if you'll be honest. Okay, you, you promised. Now say amen if you've ever wanted to get vengeance on someone. Uh, I mean, see, that's why I made you promise. Because y'all wouldn't have all said it otherwise. But there's been a time in all of our lives, every single one of us, even the sweetest, most gentlest person you can imagine, I promise you there's been a time in their life when they wanted to get back at somebody for something. The desire to get even, the desire to get justice, the desire to get vindication is strong in our flesh. Stronger in some than others, but it's strong in all of us. When I was in college, I went to this leadership event, and um, they made you sit in a circle, or not made you, but they asked you to sit in a circle, and then they would do these silly icebreaker questions, get-to-know-you questions, 
kind of like the ones Cliff puts in the sermon uh, discussion questions for y'all to do in your small groups. Kind of get things going, right? By the way, everybody should be in a small group. Cliff's questions are great. That's why you should be in there, just to get those. But the first question was this in that group. I'll never forget it. It said, if you could be any animal in the world, what would you be? How many of you have ever had to answer that one? It's a common one in these icebreaker things. So my answer, when it came to me, I said, I'd be a bald eagle. Not because I'm bald. I wasn't bald then. I said, I'd be a bald eagle. And they said, why? Why would you want to be a bald eagle, Pete? And I said, because I get to fly every day. And I can fly way up high in the clouds and above them. I could soar around on the wind. It would be incredible. And then they went around a second time, and they asked a second question. And the second question was much like the first. They said, okay, now if you couldn't be the animal you've already mentioned, what would be your second pick? What would be your second choice? And when it came around to me, I said, if I couldn't be a bald eagle, I'd be an octopus. And the leader said, well, that's a strange one. Why, why would you be an octopus? And I say, because there's a lot of times in life I have the urge to slap about eight people at once. <laughs> kind of like right now, sitting in this room answering these silly questions. I didn't say that part out loud. <laughs> now that doesn't happen as often today. The Lord has done his work in me and I've come a long way since then. But every now and then I still wish I was an octopus. But, but for real, y'all, darkness seeks vengeance, doesn't it? seeks retribution. Jesus is the light. And more specifically, he's the light of forgiveness. One of the best and most, the ultimate example of this probably is in Luke 23, 34, when Jesus said this, he said, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. And they divided his clothes and cast lots. Now the context of this is Jesus is on the cross. And he's praying for forgiveness for the people who put him there. You know, when we're walking with the Lord in his light, as John 8 talks about and commands and urges us to do, we have to learn to trust our Father. We have to trust his sovereignty. That's why Jesus is able to do this, because he had already prayed, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. I trust you. You see, when we start walking down the road of vengeance, what we're doing is saying, God, I don't trust you. I'm going to go get this for me. I'm going to go get it right now all by myself. And that's a path of darkness, not a path of light. And it can be really, really hard not to go down that road. I get it. But we have to let the Lord handle it for us. We have to learn to let him handle it for us. I love the advice of Romans 12, 19 through 21. It says, friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for God's wrath. Because it is written, vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For in so doing, you will be heaping fiery coals on his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. I want you to notice something here. You know, I think the first part of this is pretty easy to get. And it really doesn't require much of you. It just kind of requires you to keep your mouth shut and sit on your hands and not do anything to whoever you're trying to get back at. Just says, don't go after them. Don't get vengeance. But we're not just talking about withholding vengeance. Honestly, that's the easy part is withholding the vengeance. See, what Jesus actually requires us to do, and if we're going to be a reflection of his light, we have to be like him in this area of our life. And what this actually requires us to do is not just do nothing and not just go after them and not just say nothing and not just seek nothing. For Christ followers, it means we have to be light. We don't just withhold our vengeance, we offer them forgiveness. That's another step. Jesus didn't just withhold his vengeance from the men who beat him and spit on him and cursed him and nailed him to the cross. He prayed for them, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. That's a powerful picture of darkness, the darkness of what could be vengeance colliding with the light that is Jesus, the light of the world. And that that collision happens in our lives all the time as well. 
So I pray we're going to choose light over darkness, especially in those moments when we feel like, man, I wish I was an octopus right now. I pray that you'll remember right there that the, light, the light's going to win over the darkness. And there's no life without the light. This next one, number three, it's a powerful one. To the darkness of bondage, Jesus is the light of freedom. Anything that holds you in bondage is likely associated with some level of darkness. The ultimate bondage, the supreme example of all bondage is sin. All bondage finds its roots, its genesis back in sin. And there are many in our world today who are slaves to sin. They're held in bondage by it. Some feel like they can't escape from it. Others are completely comfortable in it. But they're both equally held in bondage by it. It may, may even describe you right now. Maybe it describes somebody you know. If so, I, I have good news. The, the light of Christ collided with this darkness too, and it won as well. Jesus addressed it like this in John chapter 8, verse 34 through 36. Jesus responded, truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not remain in the household forever, but a son does remain forever. So if the son sets you free you really will be free. In Galatians, it says it like this, chapter 5, For freedom Christ set us free. Stand firm then, and don't submit again to the yoke of slavery. You see, darkness, it always seeks to conceal. Darkness always seeks to confine. Darkness always seeks to cover up. Those are the things darkness does. Light does just the opposite Light brings truth, and light brings transparency to everything it touches. And we all know that a life that is lived in bondage is no life at all. If you've ever lived in bondage, you know you don't want to go back to it. So it's why I tell you yet again, there is no life without the light. You need to let the light touch anything that is holding you captive and threatening to make you a slave. Here's number four, to the darkness of sinfulness, Jesus is the light of righteousness. Ooh, this is a big one. Sin hates the light. I mean, sin really hates the light. Sin hates the light more than Dennis hates to hear that Krispy Kreme is out of donuts. Sin hates the light more than my kids hate to hear me say, it's time to clean the barn. Sin hates the light, guys, more than the Dallas Cowboys hate to lose a game. Y'all getting what I'm saying? Sin hates the light. Sin can't stand the light. It doesn't, doesn't want to be around the light. Y'all look at your neighbor and say, he's right. Some of y'all can't even bring yourself to say it, even though you know I am. All right, well, don't say he's right. Just, just tell them sin hates the light if you can't say he's right. There you go. Got more of you on that one. Sin is only comfortable in the darkness. It's only comfortable in the shadows. But here's the deal. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus spoke to them again. I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness, but we'll have the light of life. And church, we're not only called to walk in the light, we're not only called to bask and enjoy the goodness of the light. That, that's where some of us are getting this all wrong. We, we think that just because we have the light and we get the light and Jesus is shining his light on us, that that's enough because that light feels good. And we're just basking in it and enjoying it like, that's all we're supposed to do with it. The Bible actually says we are supposed to reflect that light into a dark world. I want you to hear what Paul told the Corinthians. If, if there was ever a place that was dark, it was Corinth. If there was ever a place where the darkness of sin collided with the light of Jesus and the light of the gospel, it was Corinth. And I want you to see what Paul says here in his second letter to them, chapter 5, verse 20. He says, therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ. 
Since God is making his appeal through us, in other words, we have a part in this. We're a reflection of who he is. That's what an ambassador is. He says, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. To the darkness of sinfulness, Jesus is the light of righteousness. And we're called to be reflections of that light. And we're reminded yet again that there is no life without this light that is Jesus. I have one last one for you this morning. It's this one. It says this, to the darkness of death, Jesus is the light of resurrection. To the darkness of death, Jesus is the light of resurrection. There is perhaps no other darkness that is as awful as the darkness that comes with death. You, you, as you might imagine, I've done a lot of funerals. Probably done more funerals than anybody else in this room other than Scotty. I've walked with a lot of people through those moments and through those times. And, and, and I can tell you, I mean, people like to get up at funerals and say, this is a celebration and we're happy and we're glad and everything else. And, and, and we are. We don't grieve like the rest of people who have no hope. I get it. But you can't undo the darkness that comes with it. You can be happy and you can rejoice in knowing that someone is saved and has gone on to be in glory and still be sad that they're not here with you. It's, you don't have to be fake about it. Thankfully, many of the people that I've buried over the years are people that I, I know and have full confidence were saved. Many of them I'd personally baptized or I'd had opportunities to share testimony with, my testimony and their testimony and hear about how God had transformed their life. And, and I'm telling you, church, even with that great hope, the great hope of the gospel and the great hope of salvation, there is still a heaviness and a degree of darkness that comes into your life when someone you love dearly passes away. There, there are people right now that are watching on a device, a screen, a platform, somewhere out there because they, feel, they don't feel comfortable here anymore because they've lost somebody who's not here anymore. And they say, every time I walk into the church, I think of my wife, or I think of my child, or I think of my husband. And so I watch in seclusion now because, because I, I just can't be in the room. Because that darkness is still there. This week, as I was watching that video of that man beating his daughter and then telling everybody else to stand back as he finished her off with that club by bashing her over the head. There was a degree of darkness there. A degree of darkness produced by her screams, a degree of darkness produced by the brutality, a, de a degree of darkness that came with the sudden stop of her voice and her cries for help. A degree of darkness because I knew her life was coming to an end. But I'm telling you, there was a deeper darkness there. A darkness and a sorrow because I sincerely doubt she was saved. Church, I don't think she knew the, knew the Lord. I don't know her. I don't have any relation to her. She's not connected in any way with any of our underground churches or anything like that. I could just sense the darkness there as she died. And if you've ever said goodbye to a spouse, a child, a mother, a father, a brother, a sister, a cousin, an aunt, an uncle, a lifelong friend, you know what I'm talking about. It hurts. Even when we can rejoice in their eternal destination, there's still a difficult dark time in our lives we have to navigate. And there's a powerful section of, of Scripture that I think allows us to see this collision play out in the life of Jesus and the life of other people that are normal just like us. Jesus arrives in town several days after a young man by the name of Lazarus 
the brother of Mary and Martha had been dead. They'd already put him in the tomb. They'd already sealed it up. And when Jesus rolls into town, Martha goes to meet Jesus, and they have a conversation together. We're going to, for the sake of time, just start in verse 23, where Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God who comes into the world. Jesus, the light of the world, says, I am the resurrection and the life. Martha believes it. Martha confesses it. And yet, still in Martha's life, there's a sense of darkness and despair because her brother is gone. She goes to get her sister. We jump down to verse 28. And we can definitely see that Mary is definitely dealing with this darkness. This darkness has collided with her life in the most violent and vicious way, as death often does. It says in verse 28, Having said this, she went back and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. As soon as Mary heard this, she got up and quickly went to him. Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. The Jews were with her in the house, counseling her and consoling her and They saw that Mary got up quickly and went out. They followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to cry there. And as soon as Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and told him, Lord, hear this. She says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Exclamation point. She is not happy, y'all. If you would have showed up when we sent for you, he wouldn't be dead. And it says, when Jesus saw her crying and the Jews who had come with her crying, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Where have you put him? Jesus asked. Lord, they told him, come and see. And then look at verse 35, two words, Jesus wept. This darkness is heavy in this situation, y'all. It is heavy. And Jesus cries. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, couldn't he who opened the blind man's eyes also had kept this man from dying? In other words, if he would have shown up, this wouldn't have happened. All of this is your fault. All of this darkness we're dealing with because of the death of this man is your fault, Jesus. Mary is clearly upset with Jesus. Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't be dead. This is a heavy, dark, sad time for many. This week as I was praying about this, I I saw something or realized something or recognized something that I've never really thought about or seen before. If you jump to the Gospel of Luke, there's another famous encounter Jesus has with these sisters, this family. In Luke chapter 10, in verse 38, it says, While they were traveling, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who also sat at the Lord's feet and was listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, and she came up and asked, Lord, don't you care? My sister's left me to serve alone. So tell her to give me a hand. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha. You're worried and upset about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice, and it will not be taken away from her. You know what struck me about that was reading this first encounter and then reading the encounter surrounding the death of their brother. In this first meeting, Martha is the one who's busy, seemingly too busy for Jesus, And Mary is the one sitting at his feet, hanging on every word, willing to push everything aside in her life just to be at his feet. 
But after their brother dies, you can see what the darkness of death can do even to the most faithful. This time, it's only Martha who goes to meet Jesus. Mary, the one who was so dedicated and so in tune and so enthralled and so faithful, she stayed home. Stayed home in her darkness, in her solitude. See, death can produce that kind of darkness even in the most faithful person's life. Especially if we fail to remember or if we all of a sudden forget in the midst of that darkness that Jesus is the light of the resurrection. And I want to encourage you, church, don't judge people who struggle like this. Pray for them. Because it is tough. And it is hard. Don't doubt their faithfulness. Don't Don't doubt that they're not true believers or, oh, they should just pull themselves up by their bootstraps and get on with life. Don't doubt them and don't judge them. Pray for them and remind them of how faithful God is because just like with everything else, what needs to happen in the midst of that darkness is the light needs to touch it. And if you're there right now, I want you to remember that Jesus is the light of the resurrection. There's no life without the light. I want to close with this. When Jesus said in verse 12, I am the light of the world, and anyone who follows me will never walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. When he said that, with those massive oil-filled candle arbors burning over seven stories up in the sky there in the temple complex, what he was saying is you can dance around this light all you want. You can throw the biggest party and have the biggest time of your life, but there is no life without the light that I am. He said, I am the light of the world, not these candles. I want to ask if we can to have all the lights dimmed and turned off for a moment. I have a candle here with me. and a lighter, not a blowtorch like Scotty. And Frank once said, look at how a single candle can both defy and define the darkness. Look at how a single candle can both defy and define the darkness. That's exactly what Jesus did there on the cross where the light collided with this massive darkness that seems overwhelming when you look around the room. But this little light doesn't care. This little light is not scared of the darkness. This little light is not intimidated by it. This little light defines it and defies it. That's the power of light This light tells the darkness how far it can go. It defines it. This light defies the darkness and pushes out into the boundaries of it, whether the darkness wants it to or not. All collisions between light and darkness share this in common. The light is in control, not the darkness. As we close this morning, if there's a darkness in your life, particularly the darkness of sin, I pray that you would let the light touch it. That you would let the light of Jesus come in and transform you from the inside out and make you brand new this hour. We're going to leave the lights off and just give you a moment to reflect as we pray. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. We're not going to ask you to raise a hand or stand up. I'm not going to ask you to come to the front, but I am going to ask you, if you're lost in the darkness of your sin this hour, to believe, to confess, to cry out to God and be saved. In the stillness of your heart, cry out into the darkness. Just say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. 
I know that I've messed things up and gone astray. So I ask now by faith that you would save me. Lord, I ask by faith that you would change me, make me new and make me whole. I thank you for your grace and for your goodness, for your truth and for your love. Lord, I thank you for your light. The light of the gospel, the light of your life, the light of your resurrection that touches everything and changes it. Thank you for touching me. Father, as we close this time, Lord, we thank you for being the light, for reminding us that you are the light even in the dark spaces of our life. Father, I pray that you would touch those dark places, that you would press into them and remind us of the power of the light. And Father, that we would do the same where you give us the gifts and the abilities and the opportunities, Lord, that we would be the light. Even if we're just a little one like this candle, Lord, I pray that we would be the light and that we would remember that as your light, as reflections of it, Lord, we are defying and defining the darkness that surrounds us. Help us to not be overwhelmed or to give up or to feel like there is nothing we can do because the reality is there is nothing the darkness can do to the light. Lord, we ask, we pray, we believe these things in this hour because of your son Jesus. Amen.